for future viewing. And will be available for future viewing on the MBA website at mbacares.org slash mental dash health. This webinar is part one in a series of webinars and educational trainings to be offered by MBA through the Mental Health and Congregational Care Affinity Group. And today's topic is speaking into the silence, storytelling as a path to healing. Contrary to widespread assumptions, clergy and church leaders are sought to help with psychological distress more often than other mental health experts. And so this webinar seeks to begin equipping church leaders with the tools necessary to respond to the silent cries. We will focus on storytelling and testimony sharing as a means for healing and empowerment. And at the end of this presentation, there will be time for questions. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to use the live chat feature by clicking on the icon at the bottom, bottom of your screen to submit any questions. If you're participating by phone, you may email your questions to me at mkilpatrick at mbacares.org. Again, that's mkilpatrick at mbacares.org. After the presentation, we will address as many questions as possible. And if your question is not answered here, we will follow up with you via email. Again, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on our website. So to begin, let me introduce our speakers. First, Ms. Angela Whitenhill serves as the convener for the MBA Mental Health and Congregational Care Affinity Group. She is an innovative family and children's therapist, as well as a licensed minister with experience in, mental health, in the mental health field and higher education. <clears throat> with proven success in interdisciplinary program development, bridge building, and organizational leadership. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> As a licensed clinical social worker, Angela specializes in trauma, suicide, depression, identity issues, and spiritual, spirituality integrated psychotherapy. She has formerly served as the chaplain and therapist at the Tennyson Center for Children, one of the Rocky Mountain region's leading residential treatment centers, also a partner in the MBA Disciples Care Exchange, where she helped create one of the nation's few spiritually integrated residential treatment programs. She has led and facilitated multiple training workshops in therapeutic intervention and cultural competence within the social work field. She's a graduate of the University of Denver and Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And Angela holds two master's degrees from those institutions, one in mas the Master of Divinity and the other a Master of Social Work, as well as a certificate in marriage and family therapy from the Denver Family Institute, where she served as a psychotherapist as the Institute's community clinic. And we also are um, blessed to have Reverend Dr. Sarah Griffin Lund, who is an ordained minister in the United Christian Church and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Sarah served, served churches in Brooklyn, New York, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and New Smyrna Beach, Florida. She served as the regional minister for the United Church of Christ Florida Conference, and now serves as the vice president for seminary advancement at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. She holds degrees from Trinity University, Princeton Theological Seminary, Rutgers University, and McCormick Theological Seminary. Sarah is the well-known author of Blessed Are the Crazy, Breaking the Silence About Mental Illness, Family, and Church from Chalice Press 2014 and the Lenten Devotional Fellowship of Prayer. She received awards from Princeton Theological Seminary for preaching and from the 30th Synod, Synod of the UCC for her advocacy and education for mental health. She lives with her husband, Jonathan, and their son, Carter. She blogs at Huffington Post and at www.sarahgriffinlund.com. Welcome both Angela and Sarah, and at this time I'll turn the conversation over to you all. Hey, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Hello everyone. Well, we know that there are multiple paths to healing as it relates to recovering from mental illness, but we wanna to focus today on a path that really is embedded in Christian tradition and understood as a universal element of Christian worship, storytelling. So we know that it's out of generational storytelling that our modern day Bible was born, um, but also those of us who identify as Christian, it's oftentimes through testimony and testifying that we came into the faith. And so I'm excited to talk about that today. What we may not know is that also in the therapeutic world, sharing one's narrative and examining one's narrative about oneself is a model of recovery. Um, and so we're going to talk about it spiritually and psychologically. I'm going to go to the next slide here. We want to start off. Uh oh, that work okay? 
You all see in the slide switch. Monica, do you mind? Thank you. <laughs> we want to start off by just a brief um, one on one with mental health and take a moment to really define and clarify what we mean by mental health for those of us coming into the conversation with different experiences and understanding of it. So with that, we're gonna watch a quick video that I find extremely helpful in understanding what mental health really is. It's working. Mind Matters in Minutes. What is mental health? Part one, a definition. If a student came up to you and said, what is mental health? How would you answer them? Maybe you'd say, uh, it's obviously being mentally healthy, isn't it? To which your student replies, that's a tautology. It doesn't mean anything. And they'd be right. So maybe you'd say mental health is to do with things like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. But that's a list of disorders. It's not mental health. So maybe you say mental health is being happy. But then happiness is just a mood. Our lives are full of positive experiences that have nothing to do with happiness at all. So what is mental health? Here's one definition from the World Health Organization. Mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Now that's good, but it's long. We could boil it down to this. Mental health is our ability to respond to challenges. What kind of challenges? It could be anything, from a sudden encounter with a tiger to anticipating an exam. It could be something physical like an illness, something social like bullying or being left out. It could be an all-consuming crush on someone or a to-do list the size of a shark. It could be arguments with your family or a difficult essay or the death of a parent or a long-distance move. The fact is that life rarely goes according to plan. And whenever we are beset by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, mental health is our ability to bounce back and stay on course. Now, how do you get this ability? Are you born with it? No. Mental health can change, and the things that tend to shape it are called risk factors and protective factors. Protective factors, such as a sense of self-efficacy, a supportive family, or strong friendships, tend to cushion and support you, making it more likely that you'll maintain a state of positive mental health and stay on track. On the other hand, risk factors such as chronic illness or low socioeconomic status can have the opposite effect, exacerbating the impact of disruptions in your life and making it more likely you'll experience a decline in mental health. The good news is that protective factors can offset risk factors. And even better news is that protective factors introduced in early years can help shape positive mental health across a person's lifespan. So if a student asks you, what is mental health? You can say mental health is a state of mind that allows you to cope with the endlessly inventive challenges life throws at you. And that state of mind can be at any time eroded by risk factors or supported by protective factors. That's a great explanation and your student will love and respect you for it. But it does raise another important question. If you wanted to improve the mental health of as many people as you possibly could, what do you think would be the best time and place to do that? Perfect. I love how he ends with the question, where's the perfect time and place to do that? And I think we would say the church, why not? Um, and we find that in statistics that more and more people are seeking mental health um, in their communities of faith, sometimes instead of a doctor or a therapist. Um, and so the churches are becoming these gateways to services. In a nutshell, we can learn from the video that um, Again, to have mental health, to have strong or poor mental health depends on our ability to adapt, adapt to change. A lot of times people ask me, um, what is mental, what is uh, the factors, what causes it, how does this happen? And so sticking with this idea of, I just want to make sure we're on the right slide there. Okay, perfect. 
this idea of protective and risk factors, when we think about physical illness, when so, the body is lacking something like sleep or nutrients, or we've gotten too much of something like toxins, it'll start to shut down and we have poor physical health. Kind of like me losing my voice or having been sick this past week. Um, similarly with mental illness, it's simply poor mental health. And it can be categorized by symptoms that we show, um, that show that we're lacking protective factors we need or that we have too much risk factors. Um, and so if you look here at the screen, when people ask, well, what, is it, what does it come from? Is it spiritual? Is it social? Is it chemical? There really isn't one answer for that. Um, but for those of us who need categories like me, I tend to find it helpful to understand these four main areas, uh, but they're not fixed. So we have different causes. The first one, biological factors. This is anything from a chemical imbalance. Um, I think of postpartum depression when a woman has given birth and her body physically has hormone levels are out of, uh, kind of unproportioned. Um, I think of a genetic makeup. Maybe some of us are born with higher propensities to have certain types of chemicals in our bodies over others. Um, biological issues could be a drug-induced uh, chemical difference in our body or just drug-induced differences. Malnutrition is one that can add to a biological cause or stress, like we talked about. Um, the other thing that I find is a social development or social and or development issues. So when we're talking about development issues, we're talking about things like learned behaviors, being raised in, a, in certain family patterns that might not be as healthy, um, coping skills, being taught unhealthy coping skills or having a not great attachment as a child. Um, this leads to social conflict or issues in our social relationships, which it's important to know that our, our conflict in our social relationships is not the problem. That may not be the cause of the mental illness, but it could be how we cope with it, how we handle it. That is really the, the, the problem there. Um, the last two, trauma. You guys have heard the word trauma all around. Um, there are different types of trauma, biological, psychological, and emotional traumas. Um, a traumatic brain injury, so that's a physical to the body. It could be something like physical abuse, maybe witnessing violent, uh, violence in war or violence in our neighborhood. That could be a psychological trauma or an emotional trauma, losing someone um, to death um, before you were ready, things like that. And the last cause, multiple risk factors. We heard um, our video talk about a risk factor. And a risk factor is simply various social factors that work against our vitality, our wholeness, and our overall mental health. And they create um, uh, other obstacles in addition to what life throws our way. Some universal risk factors um, could be socioeconomic status. It could be environmental factors. So we think about Flint, Michigan and the water, things like that. So, uh, social support and networks, who's in your circle, who's there for you, who can support you. Um, your ability for social cohesion or social capital, learning the ways of the world. Um, and last, access or barriers to opportunities um, could, could serve as risk factors. But depending on your mental health issue, you have different um, risk factors. Something to know about risk factors too, they have the snowball effect. So the more you have, the harder it is. Um, and simply what those lead to, and we can go to our next slide, uh, is a maladaptive coping skill. That's what we call a, simply a coping skill um, that we, uh oh, sorry about that. Coping skill that is not healthy for us. So all of us cope with our issues. Um, some of us do it appropriately and some of us don't. Um, and what I think of those is just survival. We're all trying to get what we need and we're going to do it the best way we know how. Um, so the maladaptive coping skills is what we're looking at on the therapeutic world. Also, one thing just for us in the church to realize when we're thinking about mental health is that it depends on the, the duration or the severity of one's mental illness differs from person to person. So there's things called like an acute issue. So acute trauma might be a car accident, a one time situational thing over possibly a chronic issue, um, domestic violence in the home or violence in a neighborhood that's ongoing. And these factors, uh, the coping skills and the duration and severity play a huge factor in symptomology or what we see. But for what, what's important for us, it also plays a huge factor in the healing process. What's gonna help us heal from it? Um, one thing we think about is, is mental illness curable? Some are our mental illness issues are, um, some are not, but we find that all mental illness can be healable. And in the, in the, the language of the church, healing simply means uh, the human being with this develops healthy and effective coping skills to handle and to manage the mental illness. Even if it doesn't go away, 
somehow the brain and the emotions and the, the support that they have is able to help that. So one last thing before we move into our next area, mental illness affects what well, we say four different things. Again, not fixed, but here's the main areas that it affects. It affects our relationships, our social interactions, the way we connect to one another, our ability to feel intimate connection, our ability to feel loved, um, attachment, things like that. Uh, it affects our functioning, and this could be our physical functioning, our bodily functions, um, and it could also be concentration, things like memory and focus. Um, mental illness can affect our daily behavior. And as a therapist, this is kind of what I'm looking for, our eating patterns, our sleeping patterns, personal hygiene. There are some uh, mental illness where you stop taking care of your body um, and don't even notice it. Um, and the last one, it could affect our mood. So our emotional, emotional stability, um, you having a depressed mood or volatile mood swings or feeling happy. These uh, mental health professionals are evaluating these four areas to, um, in terms of symptoms that affect these areas to determine if somebody has a diagnosis. And so what's a diagnosis? Um, a diagnosis is simply a set of symptoms, kind of like having a common cold. There are usually four or five symptoms to every diagnosis that say this person might be depressed or this person might be bipolar. Um, there are about a, over 150 diagnoses, so there's a lot out there, and trained professionals typically know them and they know what to look for. Um, and really, just to what I like to think about diagnosis, it's, it's just a, a, provides a common language for people in the field to um, treat something, know what we're talking about, and possibly research it. So it's just a name. Um, I say that because it's important for us in the church to realize that uh, it is a symptom or diagnosis is not an identity. It's not a person. It's a symptom. It's something that people have that they're working through. And so when somebody walks in our doors and says, hey, I'm depressed or hey, I have addiction to something, we can really separate from who they are um, to what they have, if that makes sense. So I hope that was helpful. We're going to shift gears a little bit and hear from a woman I think embodies the power of healing through storytelling, Reverend Sarah Griffith Lund, um, and start lifting up the idea of spiritual power that comes with um, sharing our story. Thank you so much, Angela, to Monica and Danny, to NBA, uh, to the church for this incredible gift of being in community uh, together. Uh, it's a real honor to have this time with you to uh, share with you part of my story and how as a young clergy woman at the age of 25, I was part of a, a group who um, was encouraged to embrace the God story within our lives and ask the question, what would the church be like if we shared the God story uh, with the church? Um, and sometimes that's hard for us to do, to be authentic and real. Um, and so as I asked that question of myself, I found myself um, having just buried my father who died from chronic and severe untreated mental illness. And I had always kept that a uh, secret, but this question and this invitation from the church of giving our testimonies of how God has shown up in our lives. And as we know, the biblical witness shows us that God shows up um, in the valleys. And so um, I want to thank God and thank the church for encouraging us to look in those places of brokenness and see the power of God to heal and to mend. And so this is what it means to testify to share where we were broken, where we were wounded, and how God is healing us. So uh, the next slide, I think, is a um, kind of an intro to uh, a book that I wrote. Uh, it's a book trailer, Blessed Are the Crazy is a memoir, and it's also a resource for the church. I want to thank Chalice Press for the vision to make this resource available to churches um, around the country that are really engaged in this, what I believe it's a movement of the Holy Spirit to break open this um, taboo issue of mental illness and see how God is calling us uh, as a church to be a local source in our communities of healing, of uh, transparency and shattering the silence, the stigma and shame. So we'll take a, a minute here to see the book trailer uh, done by my friend, uh, Liz Meyer Bolton with The Salt Project.
So I, I heard that maybe the audio wasn't working on that. Uh, you can uh, find it on YouTube, Blessed Are the Crazy. Uh, it's a, um, an invitation to uh, tell our true stories, an invitation to heal. And so I'm going to take a few minutes to kind of uh, share with you how this story unfolded in my life. And again, as a Christian, uh, seeking to follow Jesus, uh, looking at the scriptures, especially the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed are those who mourn. Looking at that uh, witness of Jesus to bless people who have been broken, who have been outcast, who are on the outside, I began to see my life as one of blessings, even in the midst of mental illness. And so this very uh, personal story that I had kept hidden and secret because I was ashamed, I realized that by sharing that story, um, God could use that story of shame uh, to show the power that comes when we connect with each other. Uh, the problem with silence, stigma, and shame around mental illness is that it's very isolating. And we can begin to believe the lie that we are the only ones, that uh, we are alone. Uh, when we begin to talk about mental illness, especially in uh, safe settings in the church uh, context or with close friends, you start to hear uh, that other people you know, have experiences of mental illness. And for me, uh, it was a very uh, traumatic experience. Uh, as the daughter of my father, who uh, was very successful in his life until he had uh, psychotic episodes, and it really turned my family into um, a life or death struggle. And my mom did everything she could to keep the five of us children uh, safe, while uh, my father was really lost in um, his battle with uh, hearing voices, having uh, delusions, and um, kind of having an altered state of reality that we were not able to get him help. Uh, he went on to uh, lose everything. My dad uh, was an animal doctor. He lost his business. He lost uh, his family. My mom uh, divorced him because he wasn't able uh, to really be healthy enough to be around us as children. And he lost his home. And so he became uh, one of the people, one of the many people who live on the streets, uh, who do have an untreated mental illness. And uh, these things about him being a person who was homeless, uh, having a severe mental illness that caused him to have paranoid delusions, I was so embarrassed and, and ashamed. I really kept that a secret. Even in the church, uh, as I would go to church on Sunday morning as a child, uh, no one knew. Our pastor didn't know. My Sunday school teacher didn't know. Um, our family kept it a secret. My brother, uh, oldest brother, Scott, he um, had a psychotic episode in high school. And so this uh, mental illness my father had, my brother had it as well. And there's some uh, thoughts that uh, certain uh, diseases of the brain have a high tendency to be inherited in families and bipolar uh, is one of those disorders. My brother Scott, uh, the good story and his story of recovery and healing is that he was able to get help. So through a combination of medications, therapy, family support, support from church, from recovery groups, um, he has um, had a, quite a journey uh, battling his mood disorder, but today he is doing well. And so I praise God for all the prayers. Um, part of what's happened with me telling my story is that it has created this enormous network of support and prayers so that it's no longer a secret if he's hospitalized. There are people I trust, people who I can share with and say, you know, my brother's in the hospital. Will you please uh, pray for his recovery? Whereas in the past, I would never have told anyone. I would have kept that a secret. So what we're hoping is that uh, the church can be a catalyst for the telling of our true stories. And what this does is that it honors the people God created us to be. It allows us to live whole lives. It allows us to be healed because we are being authentic. 
about our experiences in life. And we're not hiding things, we're not living behind a mask. So uh, for me, testifying, uh, sharing stories has been so liberating. And uh, I just so value this ability um, that I think the Christian faith uh, creates as we look at ourselves as a beloved community, as children of God, we have this uh, connection through God's spirit um, that longs for each one of us to be whole and to be healed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if you have not read this book, it is such a great example of the power that comes when sharing in full uh, your full story, right? The unfiltered, the raw and real story. And I, I can attest that when I read it, I feel the healing happening in the pages. We get the privilege of a bird's eye view to watch Sarah journey um, this experience with mental health and her family and develop invaluable coping skills and theological revelations that really help. And so I pre thank you for the book and thank you for joining us today. In reading it, um, our MBA staff actually read it over Lent for a Lenten practice, which was a phenomenal experience. I found some quotes there that really, to me, stood out as, as almost like, why does testimony sharing heal? How does it heal that you say in your book, Sarah? And so I wanted to lift up those quotes and just kind of ask you a little bit more about kind of what you meant by them and what you think by them. And the first one um, that Sarah said to us was to tell the truth, to tell the true story is to heal. I'd like you to share a little bit more about that. Uh, what I personally experienced uh, by covering things up or hiding what was happening in my life um, was very isolating. Mm -hmm. And um, things began to fester and uh, fears began to grow sort of out of control. You know, this fear of what will people think? Mm -hmm. uh, will people still love me? Will people accept me? And as an ordained minister, um, I think for people in different leadership positions in the church, it can be scary. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we can feel our livelihood is at risk. We can ask the questions, um, will my church still accept me as their pastor if they knew uh, these things about me? And what I have found is that telling the true story invites people to know who we truly are. And that is where the healing uh, begins because it allows us to be an authentic self, to mm -hmm. not be divided. Uh, what happened to me, uh, because I wasn't comfortable telling the true story, I am embarrassed to say this, but I told lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would lie to cover up uh, for family members uh, mm -hmm. because I was embarrassed to tell the truth. And, um, you know, in my experience of doing that, it didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel more alone and it made me feel more ashamed. Yeah. And so um, being as truthful as Thank we you. can that really um, happens so, so often. Yeah. Yeah. Or did she freeze on us? So this next part, um, sharing my testimony is liberation. It sets me free from my prison of fear, shame, and pain, and opens the door to new hope, healing, and love. Yeah, this is uh, part of the Christian uh, message, isn't it? that um, Jesus uh, embraces people in the midst of their suffering, right? Jesus doesn't um, say to the hemorrhaging woman, uh, come back to me when you are clean and pure, right? Uh, Jesus um, says, you know, you have touched my garment. You uh, have faith in me. You, um, you are healed. And so it's this, this idea that we don't have to be perfect uh, in order to be loved. Uh, that with all of our brokenness, uh, we can be blessed. And that's really where the title of my book comes from, that uh, we don't have to be someone else in order to be worthy of God's love. And when it comes to mental illness in our society, there's still so much misunderstanding about how the brain works, so much stigma and shame that um, sometimes we think we're unlovable 
uh, there's some really uh, scary myths that um, some Christians say that uh, mental illness is a punishment by God. I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe that God um, creates mental illness to make us stronger or teach us a lesson. Uh, it's a biochemical reality. As we heard from Angela, there's lots of causes of mental illness. So in our theology, in the way we talk about mental illness, to have this lens of grace, um, this lens of mercy and healing is really important. Can you all see me? Okay, good. Thank you for continuing. Jump out there. Perfect. And there's just one more um, quote that you use from Ann Carter Florence um, that is powerful, both a narration of events and a confession of belief. We tell what we have seen and heard and then confess what we believe about it. So when she's responding to what it is means to tell a testimony, why did you use that quote? Well, that's really how uh, sharing my testimony began. I was privileged to be at a conference for young clergy women at the National Cathedral. We were in the crypt of this amazing building, and I had just come from my father's funeral. And she really challenged us, you know, especially sometimes as uh, minority groups, in my case, you know, as young women who mm -hmm. don't always have opportunities for uh, leadership. Uh, in the church, she said, you know, you are called by God uh, because of all of who you are. And there's no part of you um, that God has not called. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she challenged us to, as young women, uh, tell the church what we have seen, tell the church what we have heard, um, all of that we have seen, you know, all that we have heard. And I know sometimes we um, censor ourselves. And I think that gets us in trouble because um, the wider community then experiences us as hypocrites, mm. you know, as Pollyannas or not being in touch with the real struggles that people go to, uh, go through in lives. And so when we uh, give witness to what we've seen and heard, and then we confess uh, what we believe about it, that's the testimony. Mm -hmm. And as Christians, our confession that God is there, even in the midst of the the deepest valley of mm -hmm. uh, mental illness. Mm -hmm. God is there. So that's our confession, uh, that the God of love, mercy, uh, the God who has the power to bring spiritual healing is in the midst of whatever crisis we can find, we find ourselves in. And the power of that is hope. Mm -hmm. um, that is what people are looking for um, when they are in uh, these times of deep despair and crisis is hope. Um, where do we find hope? And for us as Christians, it's in that belief that God um, is here with us always. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, these, it's a powerful book and the, the quotes from it can kind of speak to that. Um, with that, we want to, as we're thinking about how this profession of our full story, a, along with what we believe about it, helps us spiritually grow and is the message of the Christian faith. I want to just kind of amen that with some therape the therapeutic side of things. What happens psychologically when we tell our story? Um, and so if you think about um, this ish ish idea of telling our story, I usually use an example of a funnel. And you see the little boy um, putting water in the funnel. That when somebody has a traumatic event or emotional crisis or is suffering from something, um, I use this example. So here it goes. Uh, if you think about information going into your brain, is kind of like water going in through a funnel into to a bottle. As the water pours in appropriately, paced at a certain time, you're gonna get, you're gonna process that information. Well, if you dump a pail of water on top of a funnel, there's gonna be water that comes out that outside, and it stays, and it and it paralyzes, and it kind of holds you hostage to this this unprocessed information. What happens in crisis, what happens in trauma, what happens with mental illness, oftentimes is that what's happening to us, this emotion, this pain get stuck. And so we lie or we do these different things to try to cope our maladaptive coping skills, right? Well, therapy or telling our story at church or talking to our girlfriends about what happened, the full story, literally piece by piece, puts the information back through the funnel. And over time, you see that the information going back to the funnel is liberative for the brain because it makes sense of it. It draws awareness to elements of the story we, we didn't see before. Um, and every time you tell your story, so it's not enough to say it once, right? Every time you tell your story, 
the brain picks up something else about your history and about that event. And that's what we do in therapy. Over 10, 12 months, we sit there and we tell the story, but we do it at the church, right? We do it amongst each other. Um, I, we, we're having a little bit of trouble with our videos. And so I just want to plug the power of vulnerability video that's, li- that's shown there by Brene Brown. Brene Brown is an amazing social work researcher and professor, and she is known for her work around shame. And like Sarah mentioned, shame is really the culprit a lot of times to mental health issues because it silences us and it keeps us from talking about it. So we don't get help. And so she did her whole career around studying shame and what factors about shame. um, Why do people allow shame to rule? And she found in it um, that there was a connection between people who are uh, free with being vulnerable, um, who are more healthy. Really, the biggest issue or difference between them and other people was that they had the courage to tell their story, that they were wholeheartedly, she calls it a wholeheartedly telling the story. Um, They're free to talk about it. And so, again, another research-based method in the social work field about why telling one's story actually can help us um, in our mental health and psychologically. And the neat thing is the church, we're already set up for that, right? This is what we, we do. Um, I want to quickly move to our next slide here. Oh, my computer's messing up on me. <laughs> So what does the church have to do with this? As we wrap up and close and get ready for questions, um, we hope that um, the church would be a protective factor, right? And that it wouldn't be a risk factor, but that it would be a protective factor, that it would be the support system we need, the place we can feel um, exposed and unashamed. We see in the text of Adam and Eve that they were exposed and unashamed in the garden. How does the church become that where we can come and tell our full stories? Um, and, and we think about, we're going to continue to think about this through our webinar series, uh, the ways in which we can do this. Um, but today we wanted to think about a term that Sarah brings up in her book, this idea that she calls us to pick up the cross of mental health as Christians. Well, what does that look like? What does it mean to pick up the cross of mental health? And we find that there are, again, so many different methods of doing this that we'll talk about. Um, but one that, or a few that we can start with, um, today and in our churches is these three listed here, um, this idea of becoming a safe space. And we'll revisit these. These aren't new ideas, but they're great to just think about again. The first one is listen. Very easy to think about, hard to do. And when we say listen, we mean listen to the raw, unfiltered expression. The the people need to purge themselves of toxic emotion, toxic with the, the details they've seen. There are true, real feelings about things that aren't um, maybe correct, that don't fit into this our typical church culture. Um, allowing and holding that space, not judging, not talking, but just, just holding it. That's hard to do. All of our pastors out there, our pastor counselors, it's hard to sit in the muck of reality. I think of when people throw up, you can't really critique throw up. It's just throw up, right? It smells bad, it comes out. And being a space that we can allow people to do that. Um, I also want to give pastors and church leaders the permission to listen. As church people, we beg leaders to fix our problems and pastors to fix all of our problems. And so we're asking, fix our problems. Well, sometimes we just, we uh, need to allow our pastors and our leaders to just listen to us. And this is a space they can assess if this is something they can do or if it's something outside of their their skill uh, realm. Um, But in that process, when we're listening, what happens to a lot of us is that just getting the stuff out helps us. Um, And so the listening is very important. The second thing, and quickly we'll move through it, is comfort. Something that the church does that a therapist can't always do or the mental health field doesn't do so well all the time is comfort. And this happens through validation, empowerment, and encouragement. And validation simply meaning acknowledging um, an emotion, just affirming that it is, not justifying that it's there, but just, wow, you are really angry. That it's a present emotion. Empowering one another. Our faith speaks to so much of human agency, giving us choice. When we have mental illness, we feel out of control a lot of times. We have things in our lives. So to have the church empower us to say we have control because we have it in our, in our God and in our faith precepts. Um, the last one is encouragement. I cannot stress this one enough. Um, The church is really awesome at encouraging or can be. Um, And just being an element of coaching, cheerleading, uh, helping, telling people that you are good and that you're not alone. Um, Invaluable. There's not a lot of areas in our life that do this for us. The last one, and we'll move into our questions, um, is referring. And I want to give everyone permission to refer. Um, If you feel in over your head talking to someone or you're hitting a wall with someone, 
it's okay. You probably are. And that's okay. Uh, mental health is tricky. And even as a therapist, I tap out and call my supervisor and say, I don't know what's going on here. I need some more help. So I want to give us people of God to, to feel free to know our limits and, and pass it on and have people there to say, you know what, this isn't working. Let me find someone else that might be a little bit better for you. These three things, if we can start doing, um, we'll, we'll, we're already doing them, but continue doing them really help us as we move into the space of finding out how the church can pick up the cross of mental health. So with that said. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both Angela and Sarah for sharing um, just some really powerful and helpful information um, and some personal information, Sarah, about um, your particular journey and um, how your story and our stories can be um, wedded together um, used in, in our church to create safe, welcoming space um, mm -hmm. for all, but particularly in this case around um, all of us who um, want to support mental health um, and the mental health of our congregation members in our community. We do have a few questions, but just before that, I want to um, acknowledge that we have we were having some technical difficulties and we apologize for that. If you are having trouble seeing some of the slides, we will be sending those out to you via email um, and they will also be posted on our website. And if you are having trouble hearing, especially some of the recordings, you will um, we'll be posting the recordings on our the recording of this um, uh, webinar on our website, and also we can provide the links for those different videos. Um, so again, we apologize for those technical difficulties. All right, so on to question time, and we have a few that have come in. Um, this first one, actually a couple of them are from Fritz Haverkamp. I hope I got your name correct. Um, and the question is, as you guide the church to a place of testimony, do you as a church leader and facilitator want to review the testimony first? People can really start to squirm when testimony gets too personal because the church might not be ready for that. Does that make sense? Yes, that's a great, great point. Um, in fact, it's a means for its own webinar. Um, just healthy group facilitation skills. Um, we're trained to do this in the therapeutic world. There's an opening and a closing to this process. And so I appreciate you lifting that up that one thing on our on and then and Sarah, you can respond is that as, as a therapist, we we have to make sure that if we're doing group work, if we're sharing in group, that we do have to set ground rules and that we do have to prepare the group for what we're what's going on. So not necessarily um, hearing the testimony first. Sometimes we just don't have time for it. That's always great if we can. But telling the group, having them join in on the values and the philosophy that this is going to be a raw space, that you're going to hear some things that are going to be hard. Are you able to do that? Are you committed to doing that? Here's what it looks like to commit to do that. And I will sit with a group and write out a list of, in this group setting, here's how we're going to communicate. Here's how we'll respond. If things get too hard, this is what I'm going to do. But we, we spend a, two or three, no, one or two sessions beforehand, or just one session, setting up um, ground rules and setting up the approach so that everyone's on board and we all know what we're walking into. Um, if you do have a, a particular person that you're, you, you know, you have a relationship with this person, you realize that this testimony may not be appropriate for the setting, then by all means speak with them beforehand. Um, but I think what's most important is speaking with the group beforehand so we all can kind of do it together. Great Those are great points. In addition to that, I would um, say, you know, this is really the gift of the model of small groups. Um, in a small group setting, uh, you can create a safer space. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just something to be mindful of in terms of your strategy. Uh, you know, what kind of space are you opening up? Are you doing it in a worship service where anyone from the public um, could come and you open the floor to testimonies? Um, or do you prepare your congregation in advance, um, you know, lead, facilitate um, a small group study about mental health and um, kind of create ways for people to practice telling their story is really important. And the only other part I would add is the importance of follow-up. Um, when people do risk to share their story, it is so important for them to be validated and to um, know that they were heard. Uh, sometimes, uh, too often actually, people reveal things that may seem embarrassing or awkward and, and because people don't know what to say, they don't say anything. And that kind of silence after somebody has been vulnerable is actually very damaging. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what to say, 
um, then say to the person, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing with us about what you're going through. It's so important. Yeah. Monica, I have one more thing to that. Just, I think I assume that it was in a small group. So I thank you for saying that, that there, that the sharing of the story in terms of detailed thinking about, is it a, is it for the greater church or not? Just to add, there's also closing techniques. So the same way we open, there should be some sort of close, like Sarah said. And so a question to kind of add to that, a follow-up question, someone, um, um, suggested that we were probably talking about small group work, but how then does that, how does this apply to the worship experience? Are there ways in which um, mental health can be addressed in, in the life of, in our worshiping life together? Yes, <laughs> I'm so thankful for that question. Uh, there are many ways. In fact, the third Sunday of May is Mental Health Sunday, and I'm a guest preacher at a church, and I'll be talking about that. So um, in a 2013 research of people uh, preaching, less than 6% of the preachers ever mentioned anything mm -hmm. about mental health from the pulpit. So for our pulpits um, to be places where we talk about mental health, to break the silence, to include them in the pastoral prayers. Um, I love the bulletins that say, you know, we are praying for, and you can put a line in your bulletin every Sunday. We are praying for people and their families who experience mental health challenges. That is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also have uh, what might be called a mission moment. <laughs> and this is where um, you've met with a person ahead of time and you've offered them some guidance and support. And they take a few minutes to give their testimony during worship. So there's preaching, there's prayers, there's testimony, and there's even a uh, scripture uh, that can be read in the light of um, the ongoing uh, spiritual struggles. A lot of great scripture uh, references to that. And I would just add, when somebody does share their testimony in that setting, um, making sure, and this is where I would meet with the person beforehand, that they are in a place emotionally and psychologically for their own self that they are to that step. So in a therapy setting, when we talk about sharing story, it is a process and we, there's a stage where we allow that moment to go out to others. But there is a really, there's a moment where we, we don't share with others because we're still working through it. And so just really kind of sitting with that person um, and making sure that they're at the place where they're ready to fully share um, kind of what Sarah mentioned and to share the beliefs about the narrative at that place. Um, the other thing is that when um, one thing that's kind of neat is you can do uh, using the Bible, using the stories of those who have mental illness in the Bible. I find what's most when I do preach, what's most effective is that if I use an outsider story that has the more raw detail and everyone who can identify will identify with themselves. Um, and that just opens opens it up the conversation. So using the Bible or using another example from pop media is often really neat in the, in the uh, preaching moment um, as well. Fantastic. I have to tell you, I heard the most amazing uh, sermon. It was the Sunday after Christmas where um, the message was about Mary um, just giving birth and the likelihood that she may have experienced postpartum depression. I mean, it was an amazing sermon uh, that explored that issue in a really beautiful way. Oh, thank Excellent. you. So I have two questions. I'm going to kind of put those together. Um, so maybe one of you can answer one and one of you answer the other. Um, the first is um, someone said, I think one of our struggles is people who are suffering with mental health crises or long-term mental health issues can be hard to live with or deal with and love. How do you help your congregation love and have boundaries and understand um, as well as have long-term sympathy? So that's mm -hmm. one question. How, how do we get our congregations to be welcoming, but also with healthy boundaries? Mm -hmm. Then the second question is, um, somewhat related. We will have people suffering from mental health issues come to us time to time and sometimes join um, the church for the first time they've ever walked into a church, um, mm -hmm. which, I, which this person thinks could be a good thing, but they don't usually stick around for long or can't stay consistent. Are there practices the church could be developing to help the, these folks continue to come find a safe, split, safe place, um, to come and find a safe place? Mm-hmm. So both um, of them kind of welcoming questions. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a family member of, of several people in my family who have severe chronic mental illness. And 
um, that question about how do we care for family members over the long haul, you know, what can be a roller coaster kind of chronic issue. This is where we can look at models in the nonprofit sector. NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, has it's the largest grassroots organization in the country, and they have what's called Family to Family. Uh, it's NAMI.org. They have a, another part of their work is for faith communities, but I'm thinking to that issue of family to family. These are support groups um, that are designed for families to give um, each other support. And to the other question, if you're looking for a specific ministry that will uh, be welcoming to people who have um, chronic uh, mental health challenges, you can start a mental health support group that's a spiritual support group at your church. So it would be a time outside of Sunday morning. It could be monthly uh, where it's for people who are experiencing mental health challenges and their family members to come have fellowship, have prayer, um, eat a meal, and it creates a safe space outside of Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also don't be afraid to visit people in psychiatric hospitals. Um, I know sometimes people are embarrassed to let us know that that's where they are. Um, and sometimes we may feel uncomfortable visiting, whether you're a Stevens minister, a lay pastor, or a clergy person. Um, it's so powerful for you to step foot into the psychiatric um, hospital setting and show up in that very uh, vulnerable place to pray with someone and offer support. Mental illness is often thought of the um, the non-casserole illness, you know, we bring casseroles to people recovering from, from cardiac um, disease, heart attacks, but we don't bring casseroles to people in our church who are um, recovering from a mental health crisis. And I think it's time to change that. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. These are, again, inspiring for more webinars. But in a quick nutshell, um, the question about... Uh, you know, they, they don't stay. How do we respond to the some people not staying? I My first, as a therapist, I'm like, ask them. Ask them why. why. Why do they not stay? Is it the length of the service? Is it a smell in the room? Is it somebody triggers them? Is it because they just don't want to? But finding out uh, why people don't stay and asking the church, can we can we adapt? Can we change to them? I worked at Tennyson Center with um, children who had extreme behavioral issues. So asking a child with uh, extreme mental health and a, a trauma history to um, sit still, having a child sit still is hard, but to sit still amongst strangers they don't know, it's too much. So they're going to run around, right? And so I might allow for children to run around. That's hard in some spaces, but I might give them a space to do it. So asking why they're not staying, um, the issue of, um, so the idea of just in general, this the population, I'm guessing that this is more of a severe mental health issue where behaviors are disruptive to normal, what, what we call normal. Um, and so again, I would ask the church, can we shift normal a little bit? Can we allow for a wiggle room? And if we can, awesome. If we can't, then asking ourselves, it, are we are able to receive this kind of population? But the idea of um, being hard to love or boundaries, I want to speak to the boundary part first, that boundaries are extremely important for people um, in general, but particularly those of us suffering from mental illness, boundaries help us. And so I would find out if you can, um, what kind of, uh, what is the issue or learn more about boundaries around mental health, maybe not to the person, but doing more psychoeducation or education on our end. So this diagnosis needs that kind of boundary and this diagnosis needs that kind of boundary. So we as, as church leaders learn ahead of time what's an appropriate boundary for certain um, people um, and try to incorporate that into the culture of the church. Um, so hugging is very hard for my kids who are sexually abused. And when I take them to church, they don't have to hug, but we all hug, right? So we might go, you know what, in our church, we ask to hug first. That might be appropriate boundary we incorporate to help people who've suffered from sexual violence. Um, so that is a long conversation, but boundaries, finding out more about it on our end first but definitely setting them and holding them. It's very important to hold boundaries. The other part that I'll end on this, um, cause I know we're running out of time, but the idea of being hard to love, I totally understand that feeling it, it, about how do you keep giving of yourself? How do you really wrap around someone where behaviors or emotional connection or whatever's going on is hard for me. Um, and I would, this is where faith comes in. This is where theology comes in. This is where the church is actually stronger at than the therapeutic world is how does our Christ tell us to love? Right? How does our Christ also love? And that's not always giving in, and that's not always liking, and that's not always um, maybe um, responding in what we think should, but it's this idea of 
how do we love things that are hard to love? Um, and so I, that's not an answer to the question, but it sounds like what I'm hearing is that um, chronic illness and long-term um, relationship with somebody who has a mental health issue that's severe enough to, to counter what feels healthy for my own boundaries, you're possibly going to need your own support system, like Sarah said, your own people to help you narrate how to respond. And um, we don't want martyrs. That's not what we're asking here, right? Um, but there is a way that we can hold in the same community. And so again, not doesn't speak to it fully, but if we could start by first asking more questions and learning more about mental health, we'll find these um, these kind of small, subtle answers on how we adapt our culture. And then when we know when the line is crossed where we no longer adapt and that's more for the boundary for the other person. Excellent. We had a few other questions that um, I know we don't have time to move towards because I'm going to move us uh, to about how we can start a mental, for those who are interested in starting a mental health ministry in their church or community. Um, I do want to say that the question, we have captured all of the questions that were submitted and we will, um, I'll share those both with Angela and Sarah to get some feedback around those and um, share those back with you either via email or hopefully through our website. Um, we can add these questions and some answers because I think there were really um, some great questions, one around clergy sharing um, or pastors sharing in their congregation, another around um, um, as we share testimony, how might that trigger others um, who may be experiencing um, uh, mental health concerns in the congregation? Are there triggers that can happen and how do we deal with that? And a third question around um, the leadership of youth in this particular conversation. So I think there are really three great questions that we want to make sure we're able to share out with everyone. Um, so I apologize that we can't get to them here, um, but we will indeed have answers for you and share those out. So, um, Angela, Sarah, how can someone start a mental health ministry in their church or community if they haven't already? Mm -hmm. To our next slide here. Perfect. We've got that for you. <laughs> um, the our uh, our partner, our sister denomination. You see, and Sarah, you can probably talk more about this. You're part of that. Um, has developed a really cool ten step. Um, way to do this. So I'll let Sarah kind of take this on. Yeah, um, the first thing you want to do is is make a commitment. Um, and I would say that involves prayer. It's really a discernment. Is this what God is calling you to do at this time? Um, it most likely will be uh, people in your church who've been deeply impacted by it, whether um, they live with mental health challenges or are family members, but find um, a few people uh, if even if it's one other person where you're going to make a commitment to pray and explore, is God calling you to this kind of ministry? And then number two, educate yourself. And Angela, I'll invite you to say more about that. Where are some places they can go for education? Yes. Like we had mentioned our resources. Um, NAMI is a great place just to know the nitty gritty scientific stuff um, and just kind of learning the terms, learning how it works. Um, I know there are different sites that we can put on the website, but Tennyson Center for Children has a whole list of assessing uh, child abuse. So going to that website and learning how do I assess child abuse. Um, but really, I, a lot of times I will Google. Um, I will Google a diagnosis or Google an issue and just sit with, with it. We hope that on our resource page, we're going to start putting up some viable resources to dealing with different things like bipolar or child abuse or a drug addiction so that you know where to go. Um, but really being open to learning the, the scientific things about it first and then in your own way, adding your spirituality to it um, and being open to learning them more. So we'll put those resources. And I would say education includes as well what's happening in your local community. Yes. Who are your local mental health professionals that your congregation might be able to partner with? Yes. And so as you uh, go through this process of discernment prayer, if you're feeling like God is leading your church to do this, even if it's you and one other person, uh, talk to the leader of your congregation, whether that's your pastor or somebody on church council, mm -hmm. um, if you have a pastoral committee, care committee. And, and discern with them, you know, say, you know, we think God has laid this on our hearts. Do you think this is something our church is called to do? And if you get um, kind of the green light, the blessing uh, for that, then form a ministry team. Uh, it could be three or four people. And with that group of people, uh, think of what you want to accomplish. 
uh, do want to host a uh, mental health Sunday and make sure that at least one Sunday of the year, people are hearing about mental health and getting access to resources. If you did that one thing, that would be powerful. <laughs> That's significant. So decide uh, what you want to do with your team. You can mm -hmm. go on to the next slide. Um, then you want to do um, ongoing strategies. So it's not um, just a one-time event, but what can we do um, to keep everyone engaged in this uh, very important topic? Uh, then you want to look at your local resources and make sure that people in your church know uh, where they can go to for support and help. Join with other organizations. You might have a local chapter of NAMI. There might be a mental health first aid group who can come and do a training in your church. And then communicate, uh, not just within your congregation, but this is an amazing outreach opportunity for you to communicate with a wider community about the um, ministry that your church is doing. And then nurture it. Um, be in prayer with and for one another. Uh, go to learn as much as you can uh, from conferences. I know the United Church of Christ in the spring of 2017, we'll have a uh, conference that will train clergy and lay people about how to make their churches welcoming, inclusive, supportive, and engaged for people with mental health challenges. Amen. Excellent. Well, this ends today's uh, webinar, and we want to thank you all for your time. We know we ran over just a few minutes, but um, I think this has been a really uh, great opportunity to kind of share and begin our conversation around uh, mental health and congregational care and how do we care for those in our churches and communities, um, whether you're, whether they're suffering with mental health issues themselves, and each of us at some point are, or you're a family member of um, someone who is experiencing such challenges. We want to be um, a welcoming community for mm -hmm. all. Please consider the many ways you and your congregation might get involved or further your ministries to address mental health and congregational care. As I mentioned, both the PowerPoint from today's webinar as well as the recording of the entire presentation will be available on the MBA website soon for your convenience and for you to share out these resources with others. A special thank you to Reverend Dr. Sarah Griffin Lund and Ms. Angela Whitenhill for today's outstanding presentation. And to get connected to the MBA Mental Health and Congregational Care Affinity Group, please email us. Um, you can email me at mkilpatrick at mbacares.org or visit our website at um, mbacares.org slash mental dash health. And um, Angela's connect, a connection point for Angela is on that um, mm -hmm. website page as well. Our next webinar is entitled Perfect Love Casts Out All Fear, Mental Health, the criminal justice system and the church. And it's a joint project with the mental health and congregational care affinity group and the prison and jail affinity group of MBA. It's scheduled for Thursday, May 25th at 1 p.m. Central and 2 p.m. Eastern. We ask you to mark your calendars and visit the MBA website for more information and to register for that webinar. Um, remember to like us on Facebook and visit our page and um, learn more about Disciples Health and Social Service Ministries. We look um, we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye.